Hey, it's Micah back with another video today with my son once again in the background. So uh, hopefully that doesn't annoy you too much. But as always, you can just get the paper and read the papers and forego my annoying voice altogether. So uh, in this uh, video, this is going to be part one of a part five um, paper that I wrote entitled Agency and Progression. Um, President Nelson uh, told us to prepare for the last conference, and he told us that uh, that we, that the church was going to reach a hinge point or isn't at a hinge point, and he um, then told us that uh, to ask the question, um, what would your life be like if you didn't have the knowledge in the Book of Mormon or your knowledge was lost or whatever? Um this is one of actually three papers or series that I wrote with those two things in mind preparing for the conference. Um, this first one I broke up into five parts. I believe it's five parts just because of how long it is. And so um, agency and progression. This is part one. Um, there'll be a part two, part three, etc. I might – be able to do a couple of them today so you might get to hear my boy in the background for all of these so what what is this about um you'll hear it said in the church how important it was to make the right decision in the pre-earth life you'll hear that come up a lot man it must be it was really important to make that right decision in the pre-earth life you also hear members sometimes talk about how seemingly unfair maybe brutal um was this fall because you made one mistake in the pre-earth life and it damned you for eternity. Yet in this life, people seem to be able to make a multitude of mistakes and still obtain forgiveness. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, meaning that this misconception about the pre-earth life being a singular decision, while earth is a multitude of decisions, must be a falsehood. Overcoming the misconception, misconception involves two parts pre-earth life and earth life, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Yes, the decision to follow God's plan with Christ was important, but it wasn't taken on a whim. We know that we progressed and were given choices in the pre-earth life, just as we are given choices and options in this life. Some made good choices, some made bad choices. The accumulation of those choices was reflected in th that meeting the very cause those that made good decisions up to that point cheered for joy the way those that made bad decisions up to that point feared and trembled and went with satan and there were those yet who were in the middle so we know that the pre-earth life was not just a singular choice so there's the first misconception the second point of misconception is that you can you can make a multitude of mistakes in, in this life and will still be saved. And two, there aren't a couple of big decisions that will have equally exalting or damning effects as the big choice in the pre-earth life. So there's the misconception with the, the pre-earth life was that you, you thought that mm, it was just one big decision. Nope. There was a lot of other smaller decisions that fed into it. In this life, oh, you can make a bunch of little uh, decisions or um, a bunch of mistakes, and it doesn't matter. Mm, that's not correct. And and also at the same time, you don't acknowledge that there are actually a couple of very big decisions in this life that are equally as exalting or damning as the choice in the pre-earth life. President Kimball referred to something he called the point of no return, where the sinner has made enough wrong choices, big ones, that he is unsavable, not because the Savior doesn't have the power to save him, but the individual would no longer reach for the Lord's hand of forgiveness when it was offered. Mormon describes a similar state, most likely the same state, where the saints of the Lord, that where the spirit of the Lord ceases to strive with you, Mormon described teaching those people without hope and without faith, for he knew the judgments of the Lord would come upon them. Why? Because when Mormon, okay, now let's uh, we're going to the quote here. 
saw their lamentations and their mournings and their sorrow before the Lord, Mormon's heart did begin to rejoice within him, him, himself, knowing the mercies and long sufferings of the Lord. Therefore, supposing that the Lord would be merciful unto, he's talking now to the Nephites, that they would again become a righteous peace people. But behold, this my joy was vain, for their sorrowing was not under repentance because of the goodness of God, but it, w but it was rather the sorrowing of the damned, because the Lord would not always suffer them to take happiness in sin. And they did not come unto Jesus with broken hearts and contrite spirits, but they did curse God and wish to die. Nevertheless, they would struggle with the sword for their lives. And it came to pass that my sorrow did return unto me again, and I saw that the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. For I saw thousands of them hewn down in open rebellion against their God and heaped up as dung upon the face of land, and thus 344 years had passed away. Now this is this is important, this both temporally and spiritually, because we do know that in the in our time, that there will come, it hasn't come yet, there will come a point in time where there is a marvelous work and a wonder that people on the earth will have to make a choice. They will have to, it, the, the choice will be so obvious that, they will have to make a choice. And if they make the wrong choice, it says that they will be destroyed both temporally and spiritually. Now, we know this hasn't happened yet because people in the church might be able to argue that if you make the wrong choice, you are destroyed spiritually. But we are clearly not saying that people are being destroyed temporally because that hasn't happened. I saw thousands of my brethren hewn down in open rebellion. This, this has not happened yet in our time. Taking into account what we have just learned with God being the same forever and what happened in the pre-earth life, we can gather that, that the pre-earth life had many small choices that led up and built into the large choices. Once those large choices are made, in most cases, there is no going back. These larger choices in very real, real reality determine the direction that we go in the foreseeable future until the next big decision. So what do we learn? You make, you make a big choice, and it puts you on a path from point A to point B. You then make a bunch of little decisions as you move from point A to point B. They may seem insignificant compared to the big decision that you made at point A, but they are what determines your strength of character so that when you reach point B and have to make the next large decision, the smaller decisions that you made from point A to point B are reflected in your decision at point B. From point B, there is a, there is a path from B to C and from B to D, one going up, one going down. Why is it important to understand this? If what we are experiencing in this life is similar to what we experience in the pre-earth life, then if we learn what happened in the pre-earth life, we will know what is coming in this life. And what we learn in the pre-earth life is that there were hinge points where large decisions were made that sent you down a path for large periods of time. The same is true on earth. There are key choices in your life that will affect you for five years, ten years, even 20 years, years of your life will flow by like you were stuck on a track, all because of one decision you made years ago. Identifying these key moments and preparing people for them will allow them to make the most informed choice and will allow them during moments of self-reflection to understand why their life is the way that it is. Before talking about these big choices, in case you are so confused about the concept or maybe even questioning the validity of it, here are some words from the prophets and apostles that will hopefully clarify what I've tried to say up to this point in time. Hidden wedges, forgotten wedges. This is from Thomas S. Monson, but he is quoting Samuel T. Whitman. And it starts, The ice storm that winter was generally destructive. True, a few wires came down and there was the sudden jumping accidents along the highway 
Normally, the big walnut tree could easily have borne the weight that formed on its spreading limbs. It was the iron wedge in its heart that caused the damage. The story of the iron wedge began years ago when the white-haired farmer, who now inhabited the property in which it stood, was a lad on his father's homestead. The sawmill had then only recently been moved from the valley, and the settlers were still finding tools and odd pieces of equipment scattered about. On this particular day, it was a faller's wedge, wide, flat, and heavy, a foot or more long, and, and splayed from mighty pounding, which the lad found in the south pasture. A faller's wedge used to help fell a tree used to help fell a tree is inserted in a cut made by a saw and then struck with a sledgehammer to widen the cut because he was already late for dinner the lad laid the wedge between the limbs of the young walnut tree his father had planted near the front gate he would take the wedge to the shed right after dinner or sometime when it was going that way he truly meant to but he never did the wedge was there between the limbs a little tight when he attained his manhood, it was there, now firmly gripped, when he married and took over his father's farm. It was halfway grown over on the day that the threshing crew ate dinner under the tree. Grown in and healed over, the wedge was still in the tree the winter the ice storm came. In the chill silence of that wintry night, one of the three major limbs split away from the trunk and crashed to the ground. This so unbalanced the remainder of the top that it two split apart and went down when the storm was over not a twig of the once proud tree remained early the next morning the farmer went out to mourn his loss then his eyes caught sight of something in the splintered ruin the wedge he muttered reproachfully the wedge i found in the south pasture a glance told him why the tree had fallen growing edge up in the trunk the wedge had prevented the limb fibers from knitting together as they should uh, story number two, watch the switches in your life. This was done by or given by Gordon B. Hinckley. Many years ago, I worked in the head office of one of our railroads. One day, I received a telephone call from my counterpart in Newark, New Jersey, who said that a passenger train had arrived without its baggage car. The patrons were angry, obviously. We discovered that the train had been had been properly made up in Oakland, California, and properly delivered to St. Louis from which station it was to be carried to his, to his destination on the East Coast. But in St. Louis Yards, a thoughtless switchman had moved a piece of steel just three inches. That piece of steel was a switch point, and the car that should have been in Newark, New Jersey, was in New Orleans, Louisiana, 1,300 miles away. So it is with our lives. A cigarette smoked, a can of beer drunk at a party, a shot of speed taken on a dare, a careless giving in to the impulse on a date, each has thrown a switch in the life of a boy that put him on a track that carried him far away from what might have been a great and foreordained calling. And as Nephi said, thus the devil cheateth their soul and leadeth them away carefully down to hell. Three, a matter of a few degrees. This one was given by Dieter F. Uchtdorf. In 1979, a large passenger jet with 257 people on board left New Zealand for a sightseeing flight to Antarctica and back. Unknown to the pilots, however, someone had modified the flight coordinates by a mere two degrees. This error placed the aircraft 28 miles, or 45 kilometers, to the east of where the pilots assumed they were. As they approached Antarctica, the pilots descended to a lower altitude to give the passengers a better look at the landscape. Although both were expecting, were experienced pilots, neither had made the, this particular flight before, and they had no way of knowing that the incorrect coordinates had placed them directly in the path of Mount Erebus, an active volcano that rises from the frozen landscape to the height of more than 12,000 feet. As the pilots flew onward, the, whites, the white of the snow and ice covering the volcano blended with the white of the clouds above, making it appear as though they were flying over flat ground. 
By the time the instruments sounded the warning that the ground was rising fast towards them, it was too late. The airplane crashed into the side of the volcano, killing everyone on board. It was a terrible tragedy brought on by a minor error, a matter of only a few degrees. Through years of serving the Lord and in countless interviews, I have learned that the difference between happiness and misery in individuals, in marriages and families, often comes down to an error of only a few degrees. Four, another tale of two wolves. It's an old Cherokee proverb. One evening, an elderly Cherokee brave told his grandson about a battle that goes on inside people. He said, my son, the battle is between two wolves inside us all. One is evil. It is anger, envy, jealousy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, self -pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. The other is good. It is joy, peace, love, hope. Serenity, humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf wins? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one that you feed. In summary, as you move forward between major decisions in your life, switch points. The small daily decisions you make which wolf you feed will predict what your major decisions will be at your switchboards. Once the big decisions are made, once the switch is thrown, you are on that track until you can hit the next switch. That ends part one of this. Uh, thanks for joining me, Agency and Progression. Want to continue? Go on to part two.